All right, guys, welcome back, EYL. Uh, this is going to be an interesting conversation because I don't think that we've ever interviewed uh, somebody who has mastered the art of photography. Fire. Right. Right. Uh, first one, I thought I was the first yeah, one. I didn't yeah, want to yeah. say it. I yeah. didn't want to say it. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's one of these things that, especially talking about the content creator economy, I mean, you got to have a photographer. That's important. Mm -hmm. We've had photographers for since we started Earn Your Leisure. Yeah. And everybody has a photographer. Photography is something that goes back ancient times, right? Um, as far as, you know, depicting things and capturing moments um, is something that's very, very important. Um, so Cam Kirk is not just a photographer, though. He's also an entrepreneur. That's why the story is interesting. Yes, sir. So he's able, a lot of people are skilled at one particular thing, but they don't know how to actually make it a business, build a brand, make money, and have multiple streams of income. So celebrity photographer but um opened a, a studio yes, transition from you know doing hip-hop to doing corporate brands as well yes, sir and do a, a variety of other things so uh first and foremost thank you for joining us appreciate it man thank y'all for having me man this is on my bucket list so i appreciate oh, that man i appreciate that man nah for real so so there's like i said there's a lot of creatives out there a lot of people that are photographers or videographers especially now i feel like there's more photographers and videographers than ever before than ever um <laughs> how did how did you get started and how are you able before we even go to the business side how are you able to scale i know you've taken pictures of like doug and jeezy and you know like i said become a celebrity and in the photography world so what was your journey from getting introduced to photography mastering the craft and then becoming a celebrity photographer yeah man it's it's a long journey but i'll give you like a, a quick synopsis of how it started um originally from pg county maryland so back in maryland my dad's a photographer so my dad's been doing photography about 30 plus years so every apartment house we ever lived in had a photo studio in the basement mm. um but i never was like into it but it was a way that we earn allowance so my dad said if you want to get these shoes or you want to do this you got to come with me on the set or the shoot and assist so my dad put a camera in my hand very, very early, but it never was like something I thought about. Um, fast forward to when I moved to Atlanta, attended Morehouse College, fell in love with just the culture of Atlanta, the music scene. I honestly just wanted to find a way to be around it and to be you know, connected to it. When I first graduated college, I got a degree in business marketing. So when I graduated college, I was managing a, a music artist. So I had a camera that my dad told me to get I had a little camera and I used to use the camera just to photograph our stuff. Like we couldn't afford to pay a photographer, videographer. So I would be like, yo, I'm going to take your pictures. I'm going to record our music videos. And at that time, I was like the only one doing it in the city. Um, well, yeah, crazy. What time this, is, this is 2011. Okay. So from working with him, other local artists would just be like, yo, $25, $50. And I was like, shit. At that time, rent in Atlanta was dirt cheap. My rent was four hundred dollars, so all I needed to do was figure out a way to make four or five hundred, maybe a thousand on that month. I was lit. I could stay there. I ain't had to get a real job, so I was just really using my camera like that, and it was the easiest thing I ever attempted to do. Like it just it just worked. So fast forward a little bit after that, I was still just doing it as a way to manage my artists. Like I'm, we gonna get signed. This shit is just something I'm doing for right now. Um, and then right after that, 2012, um, me and my artist had a falling out and he told me basically like, I want to, like, you're not lit enough to basically be my manager. That's the, the, the quickest way he said it. And I'm yeah. like, bro, I've been pouring all my energy into you. That's why I'm not out here just for, you know, pushing myself. And at that point he just lit a fire under me. And, um, I was like, I'm going to get lit off this camera. Like I'm going to make it. By February, I had shot Schoolboy Q, Estelle, and Jeezy all in the same weekend. My name was all over Complex Magazine, everything. It just was like... That quick. It was like that. Uh, a couple months later, I was with Future, traveling with him. Like, everything just went, like, so, but how, like extremely yeah. What fast. was the step to even... Like, was it one particular thing that kind of catapulted you, or you just was hustling, just going to clubs, introducing yourself... Nah, like in Atlanta at that time, it was like a renaissance, like of of just culture. It was like you walk down the street and Future was a local artist. Like all these people were local, mm -hmm. right? So now when you look back at my portfolio, you like, man, you done shot Metro, Future, Young Thug, Rich Homie Quan, Migos. But back then they were 
the person you just walk down the street and see. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You just had to believe in who they were. So at that time, it wasn't like I was like pushing to be in certain rooms. I just was working with the community that was around me. And it was just like, they just ended up turning into the biggest stars in the world. And I was the only one with the camera documenting them. Like I would go to certain concerts in Atlanta. I'd be the only one in the press pit at that time. Were you doing it for free? That's all for free, for sure. Everything I was doing was for free. So the work kind of just found you. The work found me and then I was in the right network of people and it just, it really just took off. Like I was the only one doing it. Damn, that's pretty impressive. So that original cohort of people, you said that future, you went, you start to go on tour. So mm -hmm. now obviously this is more than just Atlanta. So like, what, what did that look like? Is it now that I'm doing this work and I'm going to be doing it for the duration of a time? Or is he just doing shows in, in Georgia at the time? Or yeah, like at that time you got to think like hip hop, and especially Atlanta hip hop wasn't as mainstream accepted as it is now. So when they would do runs, it would be like club shows at Live or something like that. So my first time really moving out out of town with an artist was with uh, first time was really with Jeezy for All Star Weekend, but that was like a really quick stint. It didn't really shake into anything. And then after that, I got with Future and I went with him to Miami for a trip. And we're just in a club. Like, it's not like touring, like where you get in the, the atmosphere of tour buses and all that. It's mm -hmm. like one off show here. You ride back in Atlanta the next day. So I was doing that. And to be honest, like I kind of failed at it with Future because I didn't really know what I was doing. So it was a few times on that road I got left in the club. Like, like you just couldn't <laughs> keep up with the energy. <laughs> so uh, Future and his manager at the time, Eb, uh, Ebony Ward, was just like, yo, you need to go work with Young Scooter. Like... Y'all, you just stick with him. He's coming up. You hang with Scooter and you can kind of get your stripes. And that's really who changed my life, young Scooter. Like, just the time we spent together. But it was kind of just that. Like, it wasn't like touring. It wasn't glamorous at all. It was like $100. You get $100, you get to go around, record some video, and turn it into like a little vlog or something. And are you, are you studying the craft at the time? Or are you just taking pics and maybe calling dad like, hey, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> I'm not studying the craft at all, to be quite honest, but I am studying the career path of the craft. So I never really, and that's that's one of my biggest regrets early on was like, I didn't really take the time to master a camera, but I did learn like, who's Jonathan Mayan, who's Motion Family, who's Zach Wolf, like certain icons and what do they, what do they do to be where they at and where could my career eventually go? Um, but I wasn't really studying the craft, but I studied just how to, like my first thing was like, how do I just make, my pictures and my videos clear. Like that was my thing, HD. Everybody's gonna lean into HD. I can learn the tricks and the camera tricks and the art style of it later. But if I can learn when I'm in a room, these are the settings to get the best quality video or photo. I did study that part. Mm -hmm. And then over time it just grew. And my dad was my worst critic. I hated telling, showing him my work. He <laughs> destroyed my work <laughs> every time. Like every time it was, it was actually like, Encouraging in a certain, in a weird way, because it made me like, all right, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna prove to you. But he was my worst critic for sure, um, and rightfully so. A lot of that work, I look back now, I'm like, man, if I knew what I knew now in those rooms and those opportunities, I could have really created something magical. Um, and some of the work has still translated, which I'm, I'm grateful and thankful of. But some of that work would have been just insane. The opportunities I got. So what is some? All right. So as far as some information, what's some information for content creators, photographers to know to have better pictures? Anything from a cell phone filter to a, a full fledged camera? Like what are some things that since you're self taught pretty yeah. much? What are some things that you learned to, along your journey to make for better photos? See, people look at art, art and photography is pretty subjective, right? So like somebody would look at art and say it's an art form. Some people say it's a skill set. Um, I'm kind of a believer in both. When I first got into it, I was like, it's an art set. It's an art form. Like it ain't no one which way to do it. You could take a picture and it's blurry and that could be somebody's favorite image. There's mistake images like that are some people's favorite images. So my advice to a lot of photographers though now is just study the ins and outs of the craft of it. Because once you learn the skill of it, you can manipulate it to be whatever it is you want. So there's no right or wrong way, but if you don't know the simple basics of ISO, F-stop, exposure, 
like you're going to embarrass yourself when you really get into a real room. We don't know how to do lighting. And I was I was like that. I was embarrassing talk, myself. So talk rooms. about that. Talk about th All right. Let's let's go. Let's go one by one. Lighting. How important is lighting and explain it like for somebody that's a novice, like that doesn't really even know why lighting is important. Like, let's talk about lighting and, and how that changes everything. Lighting is the most critical form of photography or videography is is the number one starter. Um, in layman's terms, if you're in your room and it's dark outside and you try to take a selfie of yourself, how grainy that picture is going to be, how, how dark it's going to be. And then you go and stand in front of a ring light. You know, if you've seen that or in your mirror, in your bathroom mirror, while people take selfies in the bathroom mirror, it's the best lighting in the house. It's like that is the most basic night and day. Mm -hmm. So then that applies to, you know, photography at every scale. Whether you're shooting outside, you know, if you ever try to take a picture and the sun's behind you and you notice, I can't see myself or I look shadowed out, then you literally turn around and the sun's in front of you. It's like, it's that's the most critical f part of photography is understanding that. I can have a $400 camera with the right lighting. Amazing. I can get a camera from Target right now, a disposable film camera with the right lighting. I can make something that looks like one of these album covers on the wall. Um, um, so lighting is the number one. So what's what's the best light to buy if you're in a studio? Oh, it's it's hard to say. Child, what's, what's the best light to buy? It's hard to say. It's hard, it's hard to, to say. say like, it's like what's the best camera? It's hard yeah. to say what's the best light to buy. Um, I don't think it's that cut and dry. Um, there are certain lights that you should have within your kit. I would say, like as a photographer. You want to go strobe lighting, in my opinion. There's some photographers that like constant lighting, like what you have in here now. Most videographers, obviously, are going to have to use constant lighting. I'm a strobe light type of person, but using strobe lights is way more challenging. You have to have a skill set for that because if I have a strobe light, I can't actually see what it's going to look like until I take the picture for the most part. Mm -hmm. But with a constant light, you know, you can set the lighting, look through your camera and see, okay, it's lit right here. The lighting is going to hit them right here. So I like strobe lights because you get the better quality. What is the strobe photo. light? Strobe light is, ooh, it's a, it's a flash. It's like a camera flash. So it's just, it just goes like that. Yeah. It's, it's not, a, it's not on all it's the time. It's not on all the time. I, you want me to put the strobe on in here right now? Well, strobe ain't gonna work for the video. You ain't gonna yeah, work for the video. I'm gonna be in the dark. But um, definitely, if they take a photo. The strobe is what's yeah. gonna. It's the most powerful form of the light. Um, so you can get high power. It's a, fla a flash. Flash, yeah. yeah. So they have obviously flashes you can just put on top of your camera. Then they have the ones that are big and stand up on C stands and and light stands and tripod stands, whatever. And you can get busy with it. Uh, I'm a I'm a strobe light photographer, but there are some photographers that prefer constant lights. Mm -hmm. um, it all just depends, but it's hard to like say exactly like, yo, go buy this, this, and this, and you're going to be right. Yeah. It's more like it's all in circumstances. There's some photo shoots I've done, I use one light. There's some I've used five lights. Like it literally is a style, it's a technique. It's it's really what shapes the, the, the photograph. The lighting is what creates it and makes it look a certain type of way. You talked about the functionalities inside of the actual camera. And so like, our journey is pretty interesting. We started with iPhones, mm -hmm. um, and then we moved to cameras. I never forget trying to figure out what camera. And Mike was like, "Yo, you got to get this this camera, this camera. It's got it got to have 4K." And I'm like, "All right, I got that. I found yeah. a 4K camera." And then I started seeing all these buttons, and then you just said ISO. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, "Well, I have no idea what that is." <laughs> and so trying to study that and understanding like how that changes the temperature of the room. Like, so explain the importance of ISO because when people see it on their camera, if they've never touched it, they yeah. just see numbers. It's gonna be like. 400 to 2000 and it's like what do i do yeah so on your camera there's three settings that's going to control from just basic terms how much how light or how bright your photo is versus how dark your photo is there's three settings you can change it's going to be your f-stop mm -hmm. which um many will call that like your aperture so that's how much light your camera lets into your into um, the photo that also determines how much of the photo is going to be in focus so the lower the number, most most lenses or some lenses can go as low as 1.2 and go as high as 22. Mm -hmm. The lower the number is the least amount of focal points you're going to have. So it's like the least in focus. So if I'm at a 1.2 right now, I can probably take a photo of you and your nose might be super sharp. Your eyes might be out of focus. It might be a little softer. So some people use that to dictate like, you ever seen like a dope photo in the skyline and the, the background looks really blurry, but that person just pops out. Mm -hmm. That's what you use your f-stop to control. 
if I'm doing a group photo and it's a team, I need to be up to at least F8 and higher because I need as many people as possible in focus. But from layman's sense, when you look on your camera, if you start just turning the knob, you'll just start to see it get darker or lighter. It doesn't necessarily like, you wouldn't really know. Mm -hmm. Same with ISO. So ISO controls how much grain it's gonna get into your photo. So now the beautiful thing about technology is advancing. Most of these cameras can go to a really, really, really high ISO and it, it won't really have much of an effect. So your ISO really starts at like 100 and go to like 64,000. When you're up to like the higher, higher range, your image starts to have grain and it's not crisp. So now it's like speckles and shit all in your photograph. Um, so that kind of changes the quality. So you use a lower ISO determines the better quality of your photograph. And then you have a shutter speed. Shutter speed determines how fast the photo takes. So if you are shooting someone in motion or moving, you want a higher shutter speed. And that's how you can see someone move their hands and their hand might look all blurry, but their face is in focus. That's because they use a low shutter speed. Mm -hmm. And you use a high shutter speed if you're doing sports, basketball, someone dunking, um, or, or performing on the stage, you need a higher shutter speed so that nothing looks out of focus. Or you can manipulate it and do a low shutter speed if you want a motion blur or you want to create like this wild, like artistic effect on an image of like somebody gliding or capturing someone's shadow as they move from left to right, you'll lose a low shutter speed. But all in all, to the average beginner, when they get to their camera, they can manipulate any one of those three buttons. And what they would see just from face value is the camera, the, the picture getting brighter or darker. But these are the three things you're actually manipulating. Well, what about temperature? Because I know that that plays a role too. Yeah, temperature plays a role. Like when you really get into it, a lot of people control the temperature. But again, with technology advancing so well, these cameras, you can just put it on auto. Or a lot of that stuff you can fix in the background because that's just your color, the color that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So when you don't like to do a lot of editing, you might go into the camera, change your temperature. And that just basically controls like whether my skin tone is going to look blue or whether it's going to look orange. All right. So talk about positioning um, of target when actually taking a photo, because a lot of you know, like it's like a candidates are always good. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like some photographers, they like to like get like people in the corner pocket on the cell phone. People turn their phones upside down. They yeah. get hero shots of people. Mm -hmm. Or like if you're standing in front of something, they're like stand further back. So it's a, the depth perception uh, matches up. So, um, yeah, w what's your thought? I know everybody's different, but what's your personal thought on that? Yeah, I think once you, like, you've mastered those those early ones y'all asked me about, like ISO, F-stop, shutter, and all that, that's when the fun can happen after that, right? And that's when you get into compositions and how you like to frame up your subject or things of that nature. I'm always a believer in, like, leading eyes and like where the viewer goes so sometimes uh if i take a photograph and if i do off center you know my artist whoever i'm shooting to the right i like to ensure that they're always it's very basic but they're looking in a direction of the empty space it's like you're guiding your viewer to see them and then be able to see empty space you would never basically have me turn to the left right here if the end of the frame is right here. Because then I just go off the picture and I'm not looking at whatever's left. So sometimes you can frame someone to the right, have them look the other way so that you can like show off a, a mural or something else. It just adds like it takes the viewer on a journey when they're looking through the photograph. But a lot of that stuff starts to get into like the art form or, you know, like you mentioned, people turning their camera upside down and doing all that stuff. They call it like leading lines. They definitely do help with the uh, overall like feeling that you get from a photo. Sometimes it's things that you can't describe or you can't just see it. It's That's where the skill set and the art form kind of comes into play. But um, composition is definitely very important um, when you're trying to tell a story. Do, do you feel, not pressure, but do, when you look at the space overall, when you look at everybody has a phone, the technology oh, yeah. is incredible. Oh, yeah. I, I like to call myself an iPhone photographer. See? Yeah. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. But when, when you see pictures, do you automatically identify, like, this is somebody who really does it or this is somebody that has skills on their, their phone? Oh, super. You can see it. Like, you can tell. Um, but 
where the pressure comes in at as technology advances, um, the picture quality you can get on an iPhone now is the same that you can get on the same camera I spent five, six thousand dollars from. Mm -hmm. If you have the right lighting, right? Mm -hmm. The right lighting and the right scenario, you can get the same quality. And the megapixels, which is like the image size that you can create from a certain camera, are almost identical now. You're hearing like when you see iPhone ads or Google ads, they don't even promote the the phone. They're promoting the picture quality. Like everything's about it being a camera. And, you know, even Apple has those billboards where it's shot on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. They're showing you, you can take your iPhone and turn it into the biggest scale, which is a billboard. So with, with just the world and the way that we consume media, it's all digital now. You really don't need these big cameras shooting 5K, 6K, 8K, because once you put it on YouTube or or wherever, it's shrinking it down okay. already. You're compressing mm -hmm. regardless. So it's kind of even in the playing field. So with technology advancing, I don't feel the pressure from other people loving the art form because I just think that makes people appreciate what I do more and respect it more if they feel like they're a part of it. But the pressure comes in with technology. It's like as technology keeps advancing, will people need me anymore? Or will they even care about the quality you know, to a certain degree. I think that that's what's really changing and making it tricky for photographers. And I saw in your interview, you called a star content creator a new starving artist. And I agree with that. Like, I think that's what it is now. Like the value of what we do is changing because content is being consumed so fast and so regularly that people take it for granted. Yeah. And, and it's being generated, right? When you think about mm -hmm. I can take the picture or I could just have artificial intelligence Super. create the picture. Super. The exact same photo. <laughs> so, it's wild. So as far as like, okay, you turning your skill set to a business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and really having structure as far as like, okay, this is how much I'm going to charge for my services. This is how I'm going to market myself. I'm going to make content for myself as opposed to just making content for other people so people can actually know who I am so I can build momentum. Yep. When did when did that kick in? So my career, I started following artists. So as I mentioned, a lot of the artists I work with at the beginning, I was with them at the beginning of their career. So I saw what Future did to become a household name. And I saw what Young Scooter did. And then I saw what Mike Will made it did. What did Future do? They did, like just in terms of their run, just from, from interviews, taking photo shoots of themselves, like electronic press kits, making appearances, getting style, dressing a certain way, the presentation of who they are and who they were. Um, I saw that formula from the music industry. Mm -hmm. Like I was there, I was a part of it, I helped with it. I saw them invest in content, invest in these webisodes that we were doing, putting ads on the front of their webisodes. Like I started to see it. So how it really worked for me is I saw it with the music artist side first. And like I said, I work with Future, I work with Young Scooter for the longest, and I work with Gucci. When Scooter and Gucci got locked up at the exact same time, I had to reset what I was doing and I started then working more with producers. I came back and started working with Metro Boomin, did a lot of work with Mike Will Made It. I met Metro in the dorm room at Morehouse. So I'm working with Metro like at the beginning of his career, but I'm learning things that I saw with Future and Scooter and how they were able to do certain things early on in their career and blow up. So now feeding those same things to Metro and saying, can it work from a producer standpoint? Like somebody that's not traditionally in front of the lens, someone that's kind of behind the scenes. Hey bro, don't you know you own 50% of that record just like Future? So why don't we go to the radio station and talk to them about the record? And you own it too. Mm -hmm. You know, why don't we shoot the music video for it? You know, why are we waiting on Future to tell you that, that his, that's going to be his next single? In this world, we could just get together and say, hey, Future, Cam's here. We got the camera. Turn the song on. We're going to shoot a video. And that was like a formula that me and Metro started where it was like he produced the record. I shoot the video. And we kind of came up that way. But it was propelling both of our careers, getting his songs from just being B tracks, C tracks on mixtapes and actually making the music videos which pushed those records to be bigger, my portfolio started to build, his awareness started to build because we started putting them in the videos. Like, you're gonna be in it too. And then people started to see it. So I got to see now it work from an artist to a producer. Like the same formula, we were going to radio stations, he was doing interviews with Fader, all these same stuff I saw Scooter and Future do. So when I worked with Metro and he started blowing up, he ended up DJing, getting on tour, I was with him on the rodeo tour and all that. 
when I came off the rodeo tour, you know, fast forward a little, when I came off of that, I was like, will it work for a photographer? Like, you know, that's 2015. I'm like, can I do that? I watch him do it. I watch these artists do it. Can I do that? And if you've been following me from that time, that is the formula I'm on. I'm on a music industry's formula for how to blow an artist up. That is the Cam Kirk brand formula. And that's how I've been able to stay in the game as long as I have. And that's also how I've been able to turn what's just a typical photographer into a business because they look at me as an entity the same way they look at a, a Metro or a Future or whoever. So that's really how it started for me and how it worked for me. I saw it and then I just started applying it to myself. So I do interviews. I've had a bunch of interviews with like Double XL, The Source, like the same publications that's talking about the rappers, they mm. talk about me. I've been in those same places. I treat my art galleries like concerts. They're like shows. I do it the same way. We, we have fun, we have DJs, it's not traditional. Um, I brand myself, I start putting my face on, on billboards. My own money, same way an artist would do it. Like I do a lot of the same things. I have cameramen following me. I do vlogs of my photo shoots. It's a cameraman <laughs> shooting, a cameraman <laughs> shooting. It's like those same things we're doing and I was doing in 2015 that nobody was doing. And it was um, a formula that works. And now to this day, it's, it's to me the formula for success in whatever field you're in. Um, we're seeing it now. I mean, I see, saw uh, doctors be having vlogs and cameramen of themselves. Like everybody is is branding themselves as a brand and as in front of the camera. And I think that that's a formula that I saw in the music industry early on and just applied to photography. Created history. <laughs> so I like to think so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough sometimes as you're in it. It's tough to realize what you're doing when you're talking about these artists like of course today like we know future yeah obviously we've seen what metro's doing i mean he's headlining shows and so you're part of that history as well from a technical side right you're, you're taking photos but you're also creating video music music videos from an editing standpoint mm -hmm. at this time because you're saying 2013 2014 this is like videos are starting to come onto youtube yep. what are you using at that point to really get the the best product out so again, I'm learning on the fly. So I used, um, early on, I was using Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just freestyling or figuring out things. I used to like, not like, again, I'm not technically trained. So I would just study. So once I knew I wanted to do it, I would study. So I would go and watch a music video that I liked, especially if I found one that was like a similar tempo to the song I just shot. And I mean, probably get in trouble for this, but I, I used to just take the video, download it, throw it in Final Cut, layer my clips on top and cut at the exact same format. Like, you know, like after three seconds, they change the camera yeah. angle. I would study it, like how many different camera angles do they have in this scene? How many different shots? How many different locations? And I just started to get really like technical from there and just learn how to flip it to whatever it is I'm doing um, until I was able to develop a style or a niche. And then I would just add a little something on it that made it feel like me figure out how I want to end every video so it's consistent or it's branded or where my logo pops up. So, but it started just freestyling, like taking chances. I didn't have a rule book. Um, Cause you got to keep in mind also, I started photography 2011, 2012. That's the start of Instagram. That's the start of all these platforms where content is just being given away. So the rule book that Jonathan Mannion followed does not exist anymore. Like that process of, you know, you sell everything or every picture you take costs money and everything is this. You don't just give this away for free to viral videos or just home videos like that was all brand new. So we're developing our own blueprint for how to do it. So as far as, um, OK, so you, you do that, you, you get in recognition as far as, you know, becoming a, a, a well-known photographer in, in the culture. Um, so now are people reaching out to you or are you still like kind of reaching out to artists to kind of book yourself to do photo shoots and different things like that? I've never reached out to an artist um, ever. Like I think the only one time I did that, I was really already established. And that was when I first heard Lil Baby. And I was like, "This, he's next. Like I already know he's next and I want to shoot him. That's when I first saw my dog's video and I reached out to P like, this guy, I have to work with this guy. Like, um, but bes besides that, I never reached out to artists. But Atlanta is is one degree of separation from everybody. So, as I mentioned, when I really, really got my start working with Young Scooter, being around Young Scooter, I'm every day meeting 
um, Gucci man. I met Gucci through Scooter. Then through Gucci, I met Dolph. I met Young Thug. I met like Honorable C Note. Like I'm meeting everybody in the same sphere of things. So once you get known for one thing, and I was the only one doing it for for real, like at that time. So once you become cool enough for Gucci to have you around, you definitely cool enough to come work with me, you know what I mean? Or do this for that. And there's a lot of people at that time that were around that, again, became icons and legends later. Like, Thug how, used how much, to be how, around. How much was you charging? Zero dollars for the most part. But when you started charging money, how much was you charging? When I started charging, when I really started charging money, I went from anywhere from like $150 Probably scaled up to two fifty. Started scaling up to five hundred. Um, for a shoot or photo shoot, video shoot. It just depends. In Atlanta, it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. So I was in a, I was honestly in a weird situation where some situations I couldn't charge because the relationship meant more than the petty amount of cash. Um, so there's certain situations where I'm getting phone calls at the same day. Like when I shot Migos Freak No More video, Coach K called me at twelve noon and said meet us at magic at 3 p.m we need you to shoot the video for migos freak no more there's no room to all right let's take the time hold on hold on hold on what's the budget like you know what's it's no time it's like can you be here all right i'm gonna gather up wherever i can and i'm gonna meet you there you know what i mean at that point you're shooting the video and it's like they're not talking to you about no money you know for real um, and that's like the good and the bad about Atlanta. Atlanta don't really do business the way that other states and cities would do business. But those relationships have changed my life and carried me a long way. Um, and my, my formula at that time was always the relationship with the artist is more important than the dollar that the artist can give me. Because I know our work together and the impact of our work will attract someone with the real money to be able to pay me. What, what was the, the piece or the video that when people reference you they're like yo he did that y'all seen that video which video was it in video terms it was uh young thug the language okay. it's b language it's when him and metro flipped um drake's language song that was the video that like okay he's he's dope uh, and then the second video i did that was actually didn't even think it would be that crazy was uh it was like a vlog video i did of travis scott and metro working on a song called skyfall and that video was just me capturing the making of the record uh, in the studio. And at that time, even still, Travis is like one of the most hyped artists in the world. So his fans just geek out over any type of content of him. So I did a making of that video, making of that song right before he dropped Days Before Rodeo and he put it out. That has been a video that people stop me on the street and talk about. Mm. And it's weird, it's like that video, my first Nike job, they referenced that video as why they hired me for the job. And I'm like, that that video was just me and my little camera. Like, it wasn't much, but it was those early videos that really like put my name on the map. Um, but it didn't really change for me money wise. It was just like like cult fame or like cultural fame or like stuff like that. Um, the money didn't really change or the real opportunities didn't really come until I started working more with the corporate brands and sponsors and things like that to really like push the work that we're doing. So how did that transition happen from hip hop to corporate? That transition, um, honestly, I rode a wave where Atlanta became the hot spot, you know, from everybody. So everybody wanted a little piece of Atlanta and everybody wanted a piece of Southern music and trap music. So my early jobs that were like for brands like a Puma or Nike, all that, a lot of it came from me being the go-to guy for the artists that they now were featuring in their brands. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that work was like, if we want to document a part of hip hop culture in this commercial world, let's get somebody truly from the culture to do it. So when I was up until like 2015, 2016, although I was like a local go-to guy for like camera work, even the artists didn't really respect me in a way where they were giving me their photo shoot budgets or they were giving me their album cover looks. They were kind of calling me like the homeboy, like, yo, pull up, take some photos. I'm feeling fresh today or capture a video today. It wasn't never like I was dealing with managers or labels and hiring me. So after 2015, when my name was buzzing, but my bank account was on zero, 
I was like, I got to figure out a way to how do I make money and how do I get bigger opportunities and bigger looks from the artists I'm working with. So that's when I came up with this idea called Day 4 Exhibit. And the Day 4 Exhibit is me basically working with artists and putting them on billboards with my own dollars. So in 2016, I was like, what can I say to these artists that allow them to take me serious enough to show up, dress, fresh, a right outfit, give me creative control, and let me do my thing and show that I can be creative. And I was like, well, if I go to them and say, I'm gonna put you on a billboard, especially at this time, this before Spotify billboards, for Apple billboards, YouTube billboards, I knew that they would geek and go crazy about that. So at that time, I was like, man, if I can do this, then I can one, put my work on a big scale like these corporate brands are used to seeing their work to show that I can do something billboard ready. But then also I'm gonna get the respect of the artists and make them be like, how the hell did you do that? Like, we never been on a billboard. Um, so I started that exhibit. I put eight artists on billboards. First artist I put on a billboard was Lil Yachty when he first started out. And he's the first artist that really gave me, like, creative control to say, do a photo shoot for me. Where do I show up? What kind of colors you want me to wear? What's the concept? And I'm trust you. That photo became, it's probably one of my most iconic photos to the date. Um, and that photo changed my life. But being, then when I put him on a billboard... All of the artists I used to work with back in the day came running. Like, I remember I ran into Offset and, and Richard the Kid in the mall, and they were pressing me out like, bro, you know me for so long, bro. Why you ain't never put me on no billboard? And I was like, oh, okay, I got y'all. The leverage changed. <laughs> the leverage changed now. Y'all asking me for the billboard. All right, bet. Well, show up here, do this and this and this. I'm going to put you on a billboard. And then it started to work like that. And then now it became the go-to for bigger photo shoots which then attracted Nike, Adidas, Airbnb, Sprite to be like, he's the guy that shoots the artist in this scale. No, that's a good idea. So, but how did they know that you was the one that was putting on the billboard? Well, I put my name on the billboard. You put your name on the yeah. billboard? Yeah, I put with my name. I did vlog of me going to the billboard. I, I took the picture with the artist at the billboard, whoever I put on the billboard. Like, documented the process. I documented the process. And I had strong media connections at that time where now double XL and then we're posting about it, but they were posting about Cam Kirk puts up a billboard, a mm. little Yachty and X, Y, Z. So who, who was the plug on the billboard itself? The, right, you, you didn't own it, but you had to get- Just rent it. Just rent, Just rent it. Oh, I'm saying you could rent it, but then after you do it for a certain amount of times, it's like, all right, well, you might have to change the pricing on how I'm doing this because the impact, or did it not go that way? At that time, again, you got to think in Atlanta, you know, y'all got so many billboards in New York. That's a normal thing. Right. In Atlanta, a lot of people don't know it's as simple as the phone number that's on yeah, the bottom sure. of the billboard. Like, anybody literally, could get a billboard. Yeah. anybody could do it. It was like such a far fetched idea to the the artists. Like, these artists oppressed me about billboards I'm paying $750 for, $750 for. <laughs> Like, they like, how do I get one? I'm like, you can just call the number. That's what I no, did. Nothing. I'll I'll show you how. <laughs> yeah, we're going to tell you. Just pull up, do a photo shoot with me. I'm going to get you on a billboard. <laughs> and that's how I was flipping it. So they didn't even think to look into it that much. So then when I started doing seven or eight of them, it became more of a normal thing in the music industry. I'm not going to say I started it or brought it back in the music industry. I'm not going to say that. But I feel as though prior to that, Spotify and Apple were not buying billboards. And then it became like a thing because Spotify and Apple use the same formula to this day. They get an the artist to promote Spotify and Apple over a cheap billboard that they put up on Times Square. So you you essentially put yourself in a different stratosphere than any other photographer because you wasn't just looking at it like I'm just taking pictures. You're looking at it now. I'm actually a media person Super. that's putting an artist on a billboard. Super. And that not only made w more artists want to work with you, but now corporate was like, okay, this guy is a media mogul yeah. in Atlanta that's really controlling culture about, you know, putting these iconic people and photos on, on billboards. So that was your way of kind of them reaching out to you as opposed to you reaching out to them. Super. That was the way that everybody came reaching out. I remember when I shot Gotti for the first time, Yo Gotti pulled up on me and he referenced the billboards. I want to get a billboard in Memphis. <laughs> all right. I'm like, you know, it's like, all right, let's do it. You like, like the, like the gatekeeper for yeah, billboards. It's going to seem like, I'm like, it's easy. So you, you are the plug. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I got you. We're going to do that. That's easy. So we drive to Memphis, find it's $300, $200, and we throw it up. How much was it to rent those billboards? The cheapest billboard I got was $750. For a month? 
a month or until somebody buys it. And at that time, Ain't people weren't buying. buying billboards. They wasn't thinking about it. So they're thinking they gotta call you. <laughs> yeah, I've had billboards there for six months. So for Barbara, Barbara Corkin, um, she we just interviewed her from Shark Tank, mm -hmm. and she was like back in back in the days in New York, like not not now, but like years ago, like there was a lot of empty space billboards stuff yeah. like that. And she used to just get billboards that nobody wanted, like not in Times Square, but like mm -hmm. some random place, and they would just be up until somebody else would take it, yep. and nobody ever took it. And like sometimes they'd be like two years, like just have a billboard up. Let it run. Super. And it was for me. It was leveraging and building a relationship. I built it. I put an imprint on certain artists' careers. Like a lot of people, I put on billboards was their first ever billboard. First and I thought about that long term. Like if this guy becomes a superstar and he writes a book or does anything, he's gonna have to reference that moment, how he felt when his first time he saw himself on the billboard. I thought like that deep mm -hmm. with the imprint of the work that I was doing. That photo shoot's gonna mean a lot to him. It's not just going to be a regular photo. That's the photo shoot that and putting me on this billboard. So this is the first. Now you're making money. No, still not making money. You're no. paying seven fifty. You're not, you're still doing it for free. The photo shoots to put them on a the billboard. I'm doing. I'm making local money, right? So okay. I'm working with now. That now that at that point, the local artists know me, and now that I can charge them five hundred. Okay. I can charge them a thousand. You know what I mean? But I'm not making no real money until the brand started to come. Who's yeah. the first one that bites? First brand. Yeah. First brand that really bit was probably Nike. And again, this wasn't even that long ago. This is 2017. Mm -hmm. That's the first brand that like opened my perspective to like, oh, okay, there's some money in this. Um, and I'll never forget, I got a phone call from a photographer, his name is Jesse LaRolla. He don't even know the story. He called me when I was in Atlanta and he's a dope photographer out of Chicago, but he called me to vent about the industry so he's seeing me from afar like man you're killing it in atlanta you're like me like we're doing this and he called me and he was like man these young photographers are just messing the game up cam they they charging 200 a photo shoot 500 a photo shoot and you know we could be out here getting twenty thousand day rates thirty thousand dollar day rates they don't know about usage and all that he's literally talking to me and i'm literally heading upstairs to go do a photo shoot for five hundred dollars and i remember at that moment it was like what am I, I'm bugging. Like, what do I, what don't I know? Like, I don't know. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. And he kind of changed my thinking quickly. So then the first couple, the next couple of times, I'm, my rate is just tripling, double, like just to see what happens. And then when they started to go through, you're like, oh, you start to learn in photography, you get paid based off of day rates. So a photographer, you can't just wake up and say, I want to 100 racks or 50 racks. They charge you by the day rate, the amount of days it takes you to do the job. And then you get the charge on usage rates. It's the licensing or the agreement you're willing to let somebody use the photos for. That's a whole nother payment. Then you can charge on the equipment. Then you can charge on post-production, the retouching, and editing. You have to like learn how to break down your number so you can justify higher rates. And that's what I had to learn. And then once he unlocked that for me and I did the shoot with Nike and Nike is talking to me in these terms. Okay, what's your day rate? Okay, what's the price for a buyout or, or licensing? Okay, what's the price for your equipment? Okay, do you need a photo assistant on set? Okay, do you need a Digitech? Like they're coming at me with so many things I've never thought about in my work. And then I start to see that number go from, you know what I mean, $500 to $20,000 for the shoot. And now you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know the charge for all of that. And that's kind of how it all changed. And from there, that's when the money started to like, kind of come in that's a deeper game what what how long is a term to license is is it does it all what on, you negotiate yeah. um you know what i tell a lot of photographers is just look out for that word uh work for hire work for hire means literally you don't own anything that you took so if you sign any contract and it say work for hire and you're a photographer that f they own that photo they can do whatever they want with it t-shirts product sell it flip it whatever they want to do with it you don't own it anymore so you look out for those terms but then you when you into contracts most of the nike and adidas unless it's something like major they don't really need it longer than like a year or two and they'll buy like global rights to use it uh what they call above the line or below the line above the line meaning they can use it like for anything in terms of like uh on a product or on a billboard or a lot of stuff, then some of the below the line might be social media or Instagram, things like, it may have different tiers to what they can use it for. 
but that's where the money is at because that's when you own your content then you can start to charge for like licensing and rights and things of that nature yeah. so, so, so that, like, that happened to cam right well cam but then it, so speaking of nike this was an iconic situation with jordan remember the situation mm -hmm. a few years ago with the photo of him like when he i think his rookie season mm -hmm. and the photographer sued nike it was like a 20-year lawsuit um and I think he actually ended up losing, but it was a very public situation where he, the iconic, the the thing, mm -hmm. the Jordan mm -hmm. symbol, actually, that I'm thinking about is the Jumpman, the Jumpman symbol. The, the, the photographer that took the photo of the Jumpman symbol was trying to sue Nike because he was saying that it was his intellectual property. That made them choose the logo. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I don't think that he, he actually won that lawsuit, but it was like a 20-year extensive fight, eight millions of dollars and da, da 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 But hey, it's my thing. I respect the photographer, but if I'm paying somebody to take a photo, then I don't, I just don't understand <laughs> why is it not my photo, right? <laughs> That's fair. I'm not saying that it's right. It's just the way the laws are written. That if you don't make me sign a paperwork to grant you those rights, it's just the way the laws are. So, so technically, you, anybody that takes a photo, if you take a photo of me, right? Yeah. And I use that photo for said album cover, mm -hmm. and that album sells 10 million records, right? And then you come back five years later and say, okay, I want 20% of these record sales. Can't, because You can't do that, though. What, but What can you do? You can't do that. Per se. So in a situation like that, if I take a photo of either one of you all and I and we didn't do no paperwork and then you exploited the photo and work, um, I could be subject to certain uh, rights. Right. So the first thing that's going to happen, my, my best friend's a lawyer, so he done already gave me this game because I thought the same way, like a million dollars. Somebody play with me. Well, the first thing that's <laughs> the first thing that happens is really like that. They're going to say, what are your true damages? Right. So like how. Did this, did you doing that impact my ability to monetize that photograph? So then they're going to go into my records and say, well, right now, if you take a dope photo, how much money do you make off that photo? So if I have no proof of like, well, every time I take a photo, I'm making a million dollars. If I don't have that, if it's like, well, you've never sold your work and art, you've never put out an album cover of yourself that went and made money off of, then they'll go to the precedent of what you have. And then they'll say, all right, you might be old standard rights for a photo album cover thousand dollars fifteen hundred whatever like they're gonna go down to what my damages are okay. and now if i can prove that by you doing that you stopped my ability and i had a clean ability to make money off that image and you exploited that and stole that from me i would have to kind of prove how that impacted me in terms of what my numbers would be but there's nobody in the history as far as I know, a music industry that's ever gotten percentage of an album sale for an album cover. And then I got to prove that those sales were all based off of my photo. Not that you're a dope rapper and you did 30 well, let, other let, things. Let's use a better example. Let's use a um, photo that's put on merch. That happens a mm -hmm. lot. You see iconic photos of like Supreme with yep. Dipset, yeah. right? Um, or you see uh, Mike Tyson, somebody that's used a lot in photos for merch. Um the biggie yep did the, the biggie image that's a lot on photos so a lot of a lot a lot of merch has been sold with for iconic photos that were photo shoots mm -hmm. that got turned into actual merch how's that work so you you have a better chance of winning that one because the person bought that photo based off the visual i mean bought that t-shirt or merch based that's off true. the visual of mm -hmm. what's on it so it's harder for a brand or somebody to say they didn't buy it because of this photo yeah. it's like it's, it's on the damn you know what i mean it's there it's not like music where i bought it to hear the song i bought it for that so you have a better chance of winning those so like people have sued like urban outfitters and uh, i want to say h and m some of them have gotten sued over for that i know it was a big tupac case where it's one of his photos in the urban outfitters shirt and they sued and he won hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars the photographer for it. did photographer yeah. did the photographer who took so cam's iconic Pink fur, mm -hmm. pink cell phone. He put that on a t-shirt. Yep. The, the dude who actually took the picture sued. Yep. And he won. Yeah, he will win. Yeah, he had to. So Cam actually, well, I don't know if he's paid it yet, but he, there was actually a judgment where he has to pay the photographer yeah, yeah. for using a picture of himself. That's crazy. Which is like, when you think about it, it's like. 
it's wild, but it's an art form. See, that's the part that's that the people part. have to respect. It's yeah. like if I painted you or if I did, like I literally had to do something to make that image. Yeah. I, it is a true, I think it's a true collaboration. In my opinion, I think it should be 50-50, my opinion. That's how I think it should work because that photo of Cam is nothing if that was Joe Blow on the street in the same outfit with the same phone to his ear. Mm -hmm. Cam Ron made that photo what it is. So I definitely think that there has to be some type of synergy between a respect between both sides. But it has to be both sides because some artists take advantage of it on this side and they take a photo and they just do whatever they want with it and don't even talk to you about it. It's like, it's got to go both ways. I know Jonathan Mayne was in a big suit against Jay-Z over that. Um, and they had a really big lawsuit where Jay was suing Jonathan because he kept selling his artwork, like selling photos of Jay-Z for tens of thousands of dollars. Mm. But Jonathan's like, I own the so I, who won? I own it. I want to say they settled out of court. I'm not sure who won or what they what the resolution. But you're talking about Jonathan Mayan, whose whole career he shot every single Jay Z album. Cover. <laughs> like they their their connection is crazy. So to ever see them have to go to litigation just proves that there's something wrong with the way the the law is set up. Honestly, for both parties, like something needs to be done with it. Um, but in fairness to like the subject matter, subjects that's being shot, you don't own it until you paperwork. So, paperwork so, so, so what's this thing I've been seeing on social media about people that shoot videos mm -hmm. that the, like, let's say like this video that we're shooting now, right? We don't own the video. I've seen like this thing, like similar to that. You don't own it. The guy that, that turned that camera on owns it. Yeah. What's that about? That's the well, we same, lucky cause it's the same concept. <laughs> what, explain that. I, so it's the same concept. So it's oh, like, hold on, hold on. Ty, you, I pressed the bonus. <laughs> I, I left the cameras on yesterday. I turned it on. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> and be like that. Like it's that. So uh, yeah. So explain that. Cause that for content creators, to understand, nobody ever thinks about that, right? Like you shooting a podcast, you shooting an mm -hmm. episode, you shooting even a rap video, right? And you, you know, you got a videographer. You're gonna pay the videographer, so you yeah. think I'm paying you for your services. You set the camera up, but I'm the one that's actually doing it. That's the work. Yep. It's the same way with photography. Whoever is behind that camera that pushed the button and and that composition the photo and created the, the layout and the set, that person technically owns it. Now, I do think it gets a little tricky. I'm not a lawyer by any means, but I do think it gets a little tricky if you guys own the camera that they're using. So these cameras come with copyright information built into the camera. So when I buy my camera, the first thing I do out of my camera is I set my copyright information within the camera. That automatically is imprinted on anything captured with this camera. How, so you, how you do that? It's on the settings of your camera. Yep. You go in there and you just put your name, copyright this. So that is one way. So now if it's y'all's cameras and I just hand you my cameras to take a photo of me, it gets it can get kind of tricky to say that now I gotta mm -hmm. say you did that. It's because I bought it. Now if I'm bringing my own camera, my own lighting, my own to y'all's thing and I shoot it, and if that payment doesn't spell out that this is a work for hire or this is in exchange for that, I technically could say I own it. Now, will I win in long, like, because some things are still going to be about did, like, what you know, like, did you know that or were you, was it you up front that you owned it and did you do certain things on your end to ensure that there was clarity there? Because if I go along with the idea of letting you all do what y'all want to do with it, I don't believe I can just, like, undercut you later, like, oh, they don't know that they, they didn't <laughs> sign the paperwork. I'm going to wait till this blow up. God. Like, I don't think you can do that in good faith and still be doing business and then I'm gonna catch him ten years later. I don't. I don't think you can do that, and I think you're gonna have a harder time winning that one if, in good faith, you let them. You let them to believe they owned it and could do whatever they want with it. But it's it's a real thing, and it's it's becoming more real now with um, more content being created and these these things coming out. Like you got to know what it is. Yeah, and the more that people hear about it, the more they become more aware to it, and it's yeah. like, wait, I I'm gonna try that. Super. I mean, I think you should always fight for your, your right. It's the same things happen in the music industry, right? People don't understand the masters and da 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 Same concept. Like, any, whether you're the photographer or the one getting photographs taken of you, you should think about your rights and what you can do with it in the long term. So when you start working with corporate, you was doing just photo shoots or you was, like, directing a whole content? Both. A little bit of both. So I did, like, Noisy Atlanta, 
um, that big series that Vice did. Mm -hmm. uh, I've directed some pieces for Bleacher Report, did a documentary on Cole Anthony when he was um, at UNC. Um, so I do, I do a little bit of directing as well as photography, but photography was really like, I kind of made that pivot to like be photographer first when I just thought about the longevity of a photograph and how a photograph can last a lifetime. But you're not just necessarily going back playing music videos over and over again. Some may, but a few don't, you know, but that photograph can be printed on your wall, on a t-shirt, on a book cover, on all these different things. So when I realized that, I thought a photograph had a more like lasting power. So I started to want to be more known for photography than videography. Um, so I kind of pivoted. So I'm most, most of my work is photography based, but it can be directing. Yeah, so music obviously plays a huge imprint. I mean, that's where it starts for you. Yeah. So talk about collective agency, because the way I'm reading about it, it feels like it's a label in a sense, right? Yeah. So how, how did how did you come up? How did you surmise the plan to say, all right, well, music such I'm gonna tie this into photography now. Again, it's the same formula. I'm 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 a photographer with the formula of a music artist. So again, I watch Metro Star Boominati, I watch Future Star Free Bands, I watch all these people start labels. And I always thought that that's the next step. When you get a certain level of following on your own brand, on your own art form, now you have to turn that into an empire. So my first step was turning into Cam Kirk Studios, a physical space that you can go visit. From Cam Kirk Studios, I'm like, all right, that serves Atlanta, local community. We're going to open up more locations around the world, but that's that. Now, what's the way that I can make money or grow with the next generation of people that want to be me, you know, that want to look up to me? I always think there's multiple ways you can monetize a following. A lot of times people only monetize in the way of their fans. They don't always think of ways to monetize in a way of people that believe in you and will pay to be you. And I think that that's a formula that a lot of music artists just miss out on. Because so many music artists could be having their own recording studio that people pay to record at. People would pay to record at Future Studio if it was open to the public studio. If they go in there and see his plaques on the wall, they think they wouldn't be like, I want to record with Future Records. He can make millions all over the world with a, a studio a franchise. You know what I mean? Like I think Floyd is doing it now with his boxing gyms. It's mm -hmm. like you create something that people can do. So for me, my studio was part of that because now people can shoot in the same place that I shoot. So where I shot Jeezy's book cover, you can shoot right there, the same place, same equipment. That was one. And the next part was my, uh, my label, Collective Gallery. So that came from marketing propaganda type of thing that's just truthfully what it is it's propaganda i could have called it a photography agency but that's boring you already heard of that that exists it's not a photography agency we're a label we're just like qc we're just like death row we're just like tde we're just like everything else we're a label and i'm going to take photographers i believe in sign them financially invest in them and help them become the biggest artists that they can be the same way someone has done that for Usher, someone has done that for Big Sean, someone has done that for every of your favorite rappers. And it also was a jab at the industry because when I was coming up and I needed a team of support, I did unconventionally reach out to certain labels like, why don't y'all sign me? Like, I don't make music, but I'm creating content and value around music industry. Why don't y'all just sign me? Like I'm doing brand deals with Nike. I'm doing brand deals with everybody else. Y'all can monetize me the same way if I had an engine. And it was too too far of a concept for a lot of labels to understand. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you. So in that first year, we signed seven artists, seven photographers. I gave every photographer $20,000 cash to invest in their career. And then we guide them and they got a team. We're gonna point you in the right direction. We're gonna set you up for brand deals. We're gonna expand your your capabilities. So like one of my photographers named Skrill Davis, he was doing mostly photography. I was like, yeah, Yo, you should expand it to video. First project I gave him under the labels, Cardi B. Did a documentary with Cardi B for her up music video. So it's like now you're think of yourself as a director, not just a photographer. So now that opened up a whole nother revenue stream for him. And then when you're on set, we're going to give you the same formula. Somebody's going to be there to take a photo of you on set so you can post this and show the world that you're here. That led to him getting brand deals. He's done brand deals with uh, Bacardi where he's in front of the camera holding a bottle of Bacardi, like things like that. It's like that's how we gearing it up because you don't want to just make money off 
photography. You actually can, in my opinion, this day and age, just make money off one way. You got to monetize the whole brand. So that's what we do. And it's a little jab at the industry because I think the new age label should include all forms of creativity and not just music. Does the, the 20000 come with a starter kit as far as equipment? Well, you, know, you probably wouldn't get signed to my label if you don't have equipment already. Right. So, I'm just saying, like, there's stuff that you, put, you yeah, look at and say, like, all right, that's cool, but this is actually what you should yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we guide them on what the money can be used for. Okay. So the first 10000 is put in your pocket. Just get out of the need to be in service. So a lot of photographers right now are just service providers. That's what pays their bills. They don't know how to make enough money to turn down a job or to guide their career in a certain direction, which is real. It's just what it is. So this is a little cushion money first put in your pocket. So now you can start to think more clearly about the decision or the job you're going to take next. And how does that actually help you tell the story you want to still tell for your career, which is like a luxury that I feel like I have now. Like I pick up the camera maybe five, ten times a year now. And it's all like, oh, I want to do that. That's dope. That's going to look good. If I don't want to do it, I don't do it. So the first part of money is just to give them a little cushion. The other 10 is for marketing, investing into a, maybe an art show, a gallery, a product if they want to sell merch, a book, uh, or like whatever, prints. Mm. It's like it guides you in that way. And then we also go and help you get jobs or connect you with brands and say, you're going to do this, negotiate on your behalf, give you a legal to make sure you're, you're buttoned up and stuff like that. And then you get a percentage of the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get a percentage just like a label. Uh, are there any brands from a technolo technical standpoint that are looking at you? I'm, I'm just assuming Panasonic, Rode, some of these brands that you're obviously using. Have you had partnerships in that sense? Man, I think I was just talking to somebody about this, and I think it's because I, I kind of snuck in through the back door when it comes to photography. Like, I didn't go through the traditional steps that throughout my entire career, if you look up most of my accolades, they're all, like, music or cultural focused. They're not, like... I've not been getting stamps from Canon. All my photos have been with Canon. I've mm -hmm. never had a Canon deal, right? Like I, I've had one little quick brand partnership deal with Nikon. But besides that, that's the only camera company that's ever like reached out and was like, yeah, we want to be a part of your journey. I've only been featured, I think, in like one or two photo magazines or photo media outlets through everything we're doing. Um, and I think a, a little part of it was because I think photographing hip hop and rappers specifically wasn't cool or, you know, whatever until recently, right? So now you're starting to see art shows of photo specific things, rap photos like blow up in like certain galleries or the Jay-Z museum. Mm -hmm. That's still very new of them respecting what we did. Now you can go to Barnes and Nobles and find photo books on the Beatles and rock and roll artists, but you don't really find a photo book on hip hop as often it's starting to happen now there's a few of them coming out now but it wasn't like a big thing so photo agencies didn't rock with me photo companies haven't rocked with me um so we haven't really gotten that type of support but that's why i'm starting my own my own company so and how's the art gallery i mean how's the um the gallery the studio doing as far as like how does that work what's the model behind that so the photo studio is just like a model for recording studios, similar concept, right? So if you're a photographer and you need a place to create with white backdrop, whatever colors you need and the equipment, I build a studio that you can just show up and create out of. So at our studio, we kind of consider it like a boutique studio and we kind of consider it also like a co-working studio. So in, inside of our space, uh, we're able to do three photo shoots per hour inside of our space, the way it's set up. So in our space, also what I did build into it was I knew a lot of photographers like myself are not technically trained photographers. They're coming in through the back door like me. They get into a photo studio and they get they get like uh, overwhelmed and they get intimidated through the idea of a blank canvas. And you got to bring your lights, your backdrop, an assistant, all that. Like you may not be able to afford that. You might be doing a $200 photo shoot. You can't afford your own set of lights, your own equipment. So our studio actually within the booking comes with everything you need it also comes with a photo assistant that literally helps you bring your life your idea to life so all you got to do is bring your camera um, which is very untraditional when it comes to a photo studio that really doesn't exist most photo studios are big white wall spaces and they're like all right we'll, we'll check on you after your appointment in two hours or three hours and it's up to you to figure it out 
we built more of like a community focused studio that holds your hand through the process and trains you on how to use the equipment and get the best out of your work. So within that, that's how we have like such a large community. We've done over 30,000 appointments in seven years. We do about 400 appointments a month in our space. And if you go to our space, it's on the fourth floor of a building across from Magic City and a Greyhound station. But we've been able to turn that into a gym in Atlanta that everything's been created there. I mean, we've had Showtime. De Susan Mero filmed the episode with Missy Elliott there. I've had Samuel Jackson shoot a fashion lookbook there. I've had uh, Lotto, her whole beginning of her career came up there, shot a music video in there. Jack Harlow, uh, Lil Baby, Gunna, a lot of that first ever stuff was done there. Um, it's just been a lot of magic that's created out of that space, but it's really like a community hub and a center for a lot of people to really expand and show their, their work in photography and content creation. You, you said that you are selective, right? You pick up the camera maybe five, six times a year. What, what's, what's the type of job at this point in your career that will move you? Is it inside of hip hop or is it something outside the realm that excites you? Like what, what would move you? Hip hop always moves me, right? So if it's the right artist, it's the right look, um, the right piece of history. Like I don't want to just do any photo shoot with a rapper, but if it's the right one, if it means something, that kind of moves me. So like last year, I had two accolades that really like were exciting to me. I shot um, Young Jeezy's book cover for his adversity for sale. Knowing that my career started 10 plus years, you know, traveling this quick little stint with Jeezy, that meant a lot to me to come back and be able to shoot probably his most um, iconic photo to date because of what it represents, his autobiography. It's gonna last with his career forever. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the money when he hit me about that. That was like, okay, we need to do that. That's necessary. Um, and now it's a New York Times bestseller. That means a lot to me. That's dope. And it's a, it's an avenue that I haven't done yet. I haven't done a lot of book covers. Um, last year, I also got to do Vibe Magazine's 30th anniversary issue um, with Jermaine Dupri. It was also Jermaine Dupri's first ever Vibe Magazine cover. That's a story. Crazy. Like that's like something that you're like he's never been on a <laughs> cover of R and B magazine. Like how has Jermaine Dupri never been on that? That's crazy. Whatever the case may be, that's a story. Now that gets me up out of bed. I want to do that. Like that's special right there. So it's it's those are and those are not the money looks. Those are like cultural looks that I think are relevant for me to stay Cam Kirk. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? To stay who I am to the corporate people that want to always connect themselves with cool. So I still have to do certain looks like that with up and coming artists or certain people to still show like that's me. You know what I mean? But then I it allows me to go do these corporate jobs and then be like, oh, that's the guy that shoots all the cool kids. Mm. Um, so those are the ones that move me. Um, even even the year before that, I shot Big Boy at the dungeon for Airbnb. Like those connections are like, wow, like to see that the house that he grew up in that they made these crazy albums in that he just renovated. That they bought Future to. They bought Future to. <laughs> All the history. Yeah. We're here now, years later, with Airbnb, and they're allowing people to rent it out. And I get to photograph that moment, like where he's in front of it. Like those are the stories that move me um, the most and make me like want to pick up the camera. I shot Megan Thee Stallion's graduation photos for Nike. That's a cultural moment. Everybody knows she was graduating. Nike's attached to it. That's special right there. I got one final thing in the space. Like I, I enjoy photography, so like I, I follow a few people. I know Rav B is obviously mm -hmm. incredible. What she does yeah. with Adele and Beyonce, I think Lenny's incredible. Lenny, that's what yeah, he does. Lenny's dope. Is that obviously you? You've created and you've documented history. At any point, do you feel like you create your own book of photography? Super. So my book is coming. Twenty years. I'm, I'm at a year eleven right now or really year 12, uh, I want to do I want to do one book though. So some photographers do volumes or they do multiple. I want one just like book, like he did it. And everything's going to be in there. But I also think my book should come, I want my book to come with like my ideology or the blueprint of how I was able to do this in this world. Like we're fighting so many obstacles as a photographer right now. Again, we mentioned technology earlier, social media, um, the the influx of just people that just want to do it, and to still be able to turn it into a business and empire. You know, I have fifteen plus employees that are all benefiting off of my lifestyle and what I'm able to do with a camera. Like to be able to do all of those things, it's really like exciting to me, and I want to be able to share that along with the work because. 
the work is dope. I think my work is iconic, but I think when you hear the story behind it, it adds a whole nother dimension. So I probably want to do something that's like a mixture of like a photo book or maybe it's a company by like a little, you know, a book about just the process. Well, my brother, I appreciate you. Um, tell the people how they can follow you, information on the studio and all that. No doubt. You can follow me on Instagram. It's the Cam Kirk at the Cam Kirk on my studio at Cam Kirk Studios. Um, camkirkstudios.com. If you're ever in Atlanta, you know, hit us up. We're open seven days a week, all day and night. Ty, I feel like Ty's shaking his head about everything you're saying. <laughs> Ty, oh, no, I'm in total agreement. Ty, you, you got any questions? He answered everything. <laughs> Shout out That's to Ty. Love, I know Ty guys. Davis, yeah. <laughs> nah, thank you guys. I appreciate that. Nah, all good, man. Thank you guys for rocking with us. See you next week. Peace. Peace.